Hey, welcome to the One Piece of the Time Distilling Institute with your host, the alchemist of Indiana's Black Forest, Alan Bishop. Hey, this channel is all about home distilling and legal distilling. If you've got questions, reach out to us in the comments below, social media, or via bishopshomegrown at gmail.com. And don't forget to check out thealchemistcabinet.com. Hey, what's up, guys? Just checking in from the Dungeon of Doom. I know the phone looks foggy. It's because it's humid as hell and hot as hell outside, and I got this door to this old cellar open. And so there's, you know, cool air coming in and it's just fogging up the phone a little bit. But, um, you know, I've been able to do like a 4 and 40 or anything like that with Justin for a little while because we've just been so damn busy. And, you know, Justin and Tiff, Tiff dealing with her health problems with uh, breast implant illness. She's about to go in for surgery. So it may be a little while before we get um, to do some more of those 4 and 40 things, but they will be back. Nonetheless, I do intend to still review spirits from time to time when I can and where I can. Um, probably not 4 and 40 on my own. That's just drinking way too much and that's you know not trying to encourage that sort of thing but um today i got something real special here so this came from still an old school still an old school runs a little youtube channel if you're not familiar with it check it out he does basic moonshine stuff right and he wants to share that experience with other people to help them make <clears throat> a good jar of drink at home and there's nothing wrong with that you don't always have to be doing advanced stuff i make a lot of sugar shine still on the side for fun you know uh, for myself um, there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't always have to be complicated stuff like what we talked about here on the One Piece at Time Distilling Institute mostly. Sometimes you just be making a good, simple, basic drink at home. And sometimes you need somebody to bounce that off of. Now, still an old school did send me a letter and an email that came with this that gave me the details. Unfortunately for me, because I'm goofy, I have misplaced both of those and cannot seem to find them. So still an old school, if you're watching, please reach out to me and send me the details on this jar again. And thank you for sending me the jar. I will also put this in front of Justin, probably at work at some point in time, let him taste it and get his review on it as well. And in front of some other people, I have not tasted it yet. I've not opened it yet. Um, I have no idea what it's going to taste like, but even not knowing the details, I think for a home producer or even a professional producer, it is worthwhile for people to taste things of their own merits. What do we know about it? We know that it is a simple sugar shine with grain. We know who it was made by. We know that he puts a lot of hard time and effort into this and that he's been practicing to get to a point where he can put his stuff in front of other people to get an opinion. So this review will be very much so my opinion of what's going on in here and if I think there's any improvements that can be made. I am super excited about this because I love still in old school. You guys might not realize it, but I watch all kinds of distilling related videos. I don't care how basic they are. I don't care how advanced they are. There's always something I hadn't thought about or something I hadn't learned before. So I watch all those kind of guys. And I love Still and Old School because Still and Old School ain't out there preaching that he's better than every other moonshiner out there and he makes the best moonshine in the world. No, Still and Old School is all about learning. Still and Old School is all about putting time and effort and elbow grease into this thing to be able to make something good for him and his people. So we're going to try this and see what it uh, what it does or doesn't do for us. And we're going to give an honest review because I think that'll help him out as much as anything would. So rinse this glass just a little bit. Yes, I am using one of your fancy Glen Cairn glasses for those of you moonshiners who are like, he's too fucking fancy. Listen, it's proper glassware for a fucking reason. So, definitely got to be a sour mash. There's no sharpness. You'll notice when, I, when I'm tasting something, I'll go to one side or the other. I'm breathing in through my mouth, out through my nose. Um, typically, you'll have a dominant nostril that's going to give you more information than the other nostril. Now this, and I don't know what proof it is, I can stick my nose all the way in that glass and inhale straight up through my nose. No ethanol burn whatsoever. So point number one there still in old school is that's good clean cut moonshine, man. There ain't nothing wrong with that on the nose. Now it's a little light on the nose. I do pick up some of that sour characteristic for sure that you get from sour mash, especially like Uncle Jesse's simple sour mash once you start getting into like multiple generations, three, four, five generations. You get a very distinct sour sort of nose. And I pick up the grain, <clears throat> but it's actually more subdued than I would have figured it would would be. Most most of those traditional southern style moonshines, that grain is Super punchy, right? Right there in your face. This is a little more laid back. A little more refined. So whatever you're doing cuts-wise on the nose and fermentation-wise, <clears throat> it's working for you, man. 
It's also, you know, obviously good and clear. No floaties, nothing like that. <clears throat> super soft entry. I mean, super, super soft. Um, only a slight little heat at the very finish in the mouth. None going down. Nothing there. Um, a little grain coming through. A little of that sour note on the palate. Um, and I know that that's hard for people who haven't distilled, but anybody that's ever done an Uncle Jesse Simple Sour Mash or had a moonshine made that way will know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Translates directly to the flavor of the mash itself if you were to taste it. Um, sweet, one high corn note, maybe slash rye. About three quarters of the way back on the palate, on the middle of the tongue. Sweetness at the sides. Sourness coming back to the middle of the tongue. Nice, sweet, lingering cereal taste on the finish. Zero burn on the way down. Zero burn in the mouth. Maybe a slight little, like, grains of paradise slash very light black pepper on the finish on the mouth. But very, very subdued. This is a clean distillate, sir. There are no flaws in this distillate. Whatever you're doing, you're on the right track. If I had any advice to, to offer you here, it would have nothing to do with your fermentation necessarily and nothing to do with your distillation. The only thing I do notice on this, and that's completely fine, because I guarantee you if you want to just do shooters, you want to put this in the freezer, this, right, this is fucking lawnmower whiskey is what this is, man. Not encouraging you to drink and mow your yard on a riding lawnmower. I'm just saying if you're going to, this is kind of what you're after on a hot day, right? It just is what it is. My advice here would be, I think it could be a little more punchy with some grain. Um, I think that the, the mouth feels very light, right? So it's almost like the entry. The entry is so light, and this is not a bad thing. I think that for people who want just a good drink that doesn't have a lot of like real heavy character to it this is perfect right for a light whiskey drinker a vodka drinker or somebody who's not familiar with moonshine you have hit the fucking beginners category there with those <clears throat> with those people with that audience one million percent if i did anything i might try to spruce it up just a little bit so i think if maybe you used um and maybe you did use them in here but i think even if you did, if you use like a heavier proportion of some oats, like Quaker oatmeal, um, I'm not even going to give you a weight, just, you know, give you a rough idea. But if you're doing 50 gallon mash, throw a couple of cans of Quaker oats in here. That mouthfeel is going to get silky, velvety, beautiful. Still maintain that lightness and that grace that this has, but be more experiential on the palate overall. And I think that that would, that would really help um, the initial entry as well as the finish, the lingering effect, that sweetness and that grain, that cereal note that comes through. If you had some oats in there with some of those long chain fatty acids, it would hold on to a lot more of that for a lot longer. And it'd be something that when you took a drink of it, you would want to analyze for a little while before you went back to it instead of just shooting one right after the other. Because I'll tell you right now, that right there, when I'm doing historic demonstrations places or doing historic reenactments, that jar there, get me in some fucking trouble real fucking quick. Um, the other thing is, I vaguely remember you, I think you said that there was rye in this. Fly in here, sorry. If there is rye in this, and I'm sure there is, because I do pick up on some of that characteristic, I might punch that rye up a little bit. I don't know if you're grinding your rye or you're using whole rye or what you're using there, but if you're using a whole rye, I might grind it a little bit. I might even up the amount of rye to some degree to where you can at least get, there's, there's that faint, rye can sometimes go in that kind of cinnamon direction there's that faint cinnamon thing there but it's a very very faint and you have to search for it and i'm not sure everyone will get it if you pump that up just a little bit to where that high note that's that cereal note in the middle of the palate on top of the tongue would pop just a little bit more and you get a little bit more of that grains of paradise black pepper on the finish it'd be 
the fucking phenomenal. You know, the big thing is trying to avoid the burn on the way down. There ain't no burn here, man. This is honestly of the moonshines that I've reviewed in my life or tasted in my life. This is fuck, dude. This is good. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Still in old school. <clears throat> that jar right there is getting drank. I haven't drank for a week. That jar is going down. It's happening. I ain't sharing that with nobody. That one's mine. Um, listen, if you was in the habit of selling, and I know you ain't, and I was your neighbor, I'd be at your fucking house every week. I'd sell my moonshine and come buy your stuff. So, but all right, guys. As always, if you have questions, oh wait, I have a bonus for you guys. Actually, give me just one second. Let me rinse this glass out with some water, and uh, I got something else to put in front of you because I want to brag on it for a minute. I'll be right back. All right, here we go, back again. So, let me preface this by saying that I wanted to make an absinthe for myself. I do this every year, but I wanted to make enough to actually last me for a good little while. So, I went deep on my botanicals. This thing would have cost a fortune if I didn't have botanicals I was growing myself, or I hadn't been collecting botanicals the past couple of years. But I did an absinthe that yielded right at two gallons of absinthe and the amount of botanicals that went into that you're talking right around three gallons of dried botanical material to make this two gallons of absinthe well and it's a different absinthe than what i normally make um it is definitely within that swiss blanche style of absinthe um, a little more savory a little lighter initially but then we pumped it up with some unique American Allen Bishop Southern Indiana ingredients to make it our own thing and that was the point I didn't initially set out to make this absinthe into something I was going to do commercially but from what I can tell so far it's turned out well enough that if I don't do something commercially with this I'm an idiot now I did do two 1030 barrels of this I did a um, 1030 used French oak wine barrel head and then I did a 1030 10 year Oregon oak that I also put some Makers 46 French oak staves that had been soaked in Madeira into because I wanted to actually age a little absinthe. This is something that I've done at Streets of French Lake many times with what we call our Fascination Street absinthe. It's something that nobody else really does, either in a new American oak barrel or a used barrel, um, bringing a different sort of uh, a play upon absinthe. So instead of having a glass of absinthe that you're going to luge down before or after supper or just a drink in the session, um, these are designed to be specifically dessert style absinthe. So in other words, you're going to finish your meal and you're going to have a glass of this that we're going to proof down to like 106, 110, something like that, like a whiskey. Think of it like a dessert whiskey and that's what we're doing with those absinths. But I set aside the rest of that and I was going to divide it up into my normal purple absinthe or my amethyst absinthe that we talked about before and my marigold colored absinthe. I did not <clears throat> record the botanicals I put in it for this channel. I did not record the process. I probably won't be doing a lot of process stuff in the future, just so you guys are aware. Um, even if I had recorded those things, this turned out so well. You know, I'm usually very open with what I do and have no secrets. This turned out so well that it's going to end up being a commercial product and I just, I can't tell you guys exactly what I did. What I can tell you is I came up with a cool coloration that is natural, 100% natural. Um, they created a category of absinthe that hasn't existed before, which I've done now a couple times, I think, between the, um, uh, the amethyst absinthe and the marigold absinthe. What we have here is black absinthe, right? If you're going to go weird, go all the way weird. This, all the way weird. It's trying to hold it where you can see some of that light shine through it here. Let me see something. Yeah, well, that ain't really working. Hey, there you go. You can see on the bottom there how dark that is. <clears throat> I've not tried it yet, other than when I was distilling it. And I can tell you that there was enough wormwood in it. Um, somewhere in the 120 gram per gallon wormwood. And this is setting at 140 something right now. That when I first distilled it, it was a little too bitter for me. But as with all things that are white spirits that come off the still or going to be colored post distillation, it needed to set an air out for a little while. So I let it set an air out for a little while. 
didn't just let it set in air out. I macerated it with a coloring ingredient and I actually put it on a heating pad in that little copper pot still, which has a little vent hole in the top of it and let it vaporize to some degree. The aroma here, listen, I know a lot of you think absinthe is just straight black licorice, but black licorice and absinthe have, <sighs> black licorice comes from anise, or black licorice flavor is similar to anise, but they're not exactly the same. If you like root beer, if you like Dr. Pepper, you're probably gonna like absinthe. This absinthe leans ironically heavily, and I didn't even intend to do it because I just recently finished up that 23 gin that we talked about, paying tribute to Dr. Pepper and the history of it. This leans more towards Dr. Pepper than say Barks root beer, which a lot of traditional absinthe can lean towards that. Um, aroma wise of all the absinths I've ever made, this is the one I'm most proud of. There's a little apple mint in here, I can tell you that, um, that's giving a, just a, a beautiful gracious note right above everything else and in line with the anise. So I wanted to try this with you guys since this is the first time that a black absinthe has ever existed and the first time that this absinthe uh, botanical bill has ever existed. I do not have a proper absinthe glass, as you see, using the Glen Cairn again. We're going to try it neat at 140, which is probably high and dumb. <laughs> Let's just be honest. And we're just gonna have a sip of it. And then we're going to loose it and see what color it turns, so. Oh man, that is black too, look at that. Oh, that was a big pour. I didn't do that on purpose. Glad the rest of my day is going to be spent recording podcasts for one piece of time, sacred and profane, as well as um, if you have ghosts, you have everything. Otherwise, go south quick. So, again, the nose leans into the Dr. Pepper thing. There's some, some lemon on the top there, lemon balm, some of that apple mint, some spearmint. There's an earthy angelica thing. There's an earthy licorice root thing. I'm giving you some hints to what's in here, obviously. Some of them are pretty obvious, but. The fennel is there, but it's not super herbaceous. It's not like smelling, you know, a pizza with fennel on it, for example. And then the base coloration agent, which again, I can't tell you because I have plans for, it is here as well. It is definitely here. It's not just for color, it's for flavor and aroma. On and on and on. Holy shit, guys. <clears throat> we'll tell you this. This is an agave base absinthe as well. Initial hit, that sweet anise. Mouth feels creamy, velvety, full bodied. Some grains of paradise in there, a little heat at the sides, a little cinnamon. Um, the wormwood, the herbaceousness of the wormwood starts to pop on the sides, mid palate, comes back on the finish at the front, exhaling almost like wormwood. And honestly, it's going to sound goofy, but you ever have some really good fruity marijuana when you exhale you'll get something similar to what you get on the finish on this that terpene sort of profile um it's sweet but it's also pastoral it's also somewhat bitter but very lightly bitter i can tell you right now that one little drink of it there's no heat going down even at 140 there's no heat on the palate and absinthe is, does, is doing right now to me exactly what absinthe is supposed to do. I didn't even realize that my stomach was a little unsettled, but apparently it was, and I can feel it just like you took some stomach medicine. It just straightens everything out. This might be the best absinthe I've ever created. Now, whether or not I can do it again is a question, and whether or not it scales up is even more of a question. Um, and eventually I'll tell you guys what's in it, but not right now. There is a little heat from the alcohol on the nose, but bear in mind this is 140 proof in this glass. There's gonna be some heat there.
there's a salinity to it almost. <clears throat> there is an effect from um, anise. Um, it's, it's caused by a compound called anethol related to anesthesia where the tip of your tongue goes slightly numb. That's there. There's this effect of it spreading across the palate being very silky. That's also there. There are some comparisons again to Dr. Pepper and actually if I had more of this I might make a Dr. Pepper highball with it just out of fucking shits and giggles. But I think what I'm going to do right now I'm going to stop and I'll come back to you. I'm going to see if I can find something put some cold water in and let's see if we can loose this down for you. All right. We're going to loose this down and make sure you guys can see it well and see how it looshes. What the loosh basically is is you add water to the absinthe. It's usually one part absinthe to three parts water, typically. Um, that actually causes the oils from those botanicals to fall out of suspension and to cloud or to go opaque. I don't know what color this will change. Probably a pink color would be my guess, more than likely, but we will see. I've got some nice Berkey filtered water here. I'm gonna loose it and then we'll give it another taste again. Make sure we get up here where you guys can really get a good view Looky there. There's the fairy. Oh, she's going to stay dark. Dark, dark, dark. There's the full loose right there. If that ain't the most gothic fucking absinthe that's ever been made, I don't know what is. I mean, that's straight up. Fucking give me a label that says coffin nails right now. Let's see what that did for our flavor here and our aroma. Oh, man, that softened the aroma big time. That did bring the bittering compounds or the floral compounds in particular of the wormwood much more to the forefront on the nose. Now, a lot of times people would loose this with sugar as well. Um, typically, I like my absinthe without the sugar, but this might be one where you need it because of the amount of wormwood. The anise is there, but it's playing off of this earthy um, ozone, right? You go outside after a fresh rain in the springtime, that, that aroma, that ozone smell. You can tell that even though there's some bitterness here, it's triggering the part of your brain that thinks more long food. My brain immediately goes to like custard. I can't believe how black that loose is. Look at that shit. Super creamy palette. Lemon balm, <clears throat> lemon pill, earthy, ozone, soft, custardy, think of a uh, custard filled long john, very pastry like, lots of pastry notes in there. Man, it's got, there's a lot of roots in here too. I should mention that. And those, those roots are definitely modifying the flavors to go earthy, dark, heavy, bold, bold. I mean, if you are into music like I am and you want to pair things with music, this right here is the cure disintegration in a fucking glass. Um, I'm pretty fucking happy with this. This is unique right here. Uh, very, very unique. And again, I can't believe how dark that looshed. Look at that. That's crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. I'm just going to keep making absinthe until people start liking it. 
If they don't, I'll just drink it all. All right, guys. There's your two reviews. Hope you enjoyed them. We'll be back soon. Love you.